Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, we've got a number of updates for you today as it relates to COVID-19 and Hurricane Laura. Uh, but I want to start with a slide of the weather right now. Um, and if you look up there, there's a lot of tropical activity. Uh, and it seems like the coast of Africa is spitting out uh, uh, one or two storms every day uh, recently. But what I really want to bring everybody's attention to is that red X that's just off of Florida. Uh, because uh, since our weather update this morning with the National Weather Service, uh, they have increased the likelihood of development of that storm system into a tropical uh, depression or a tropical storm. Uh, and several models have it coming into southeast Louisiana as early as Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. Uh, and so this is changing rapidly, as I said, uh, because that's not what they briefed uh, earlier this morning, but I think the one o'clock update, they did that. So I'm asking everybody uh, in Louisiana, principally in southeast Louisiana in this instance, uh, to make sure that you're mindful of the weather, uh, that, that if you haven't done so yet, make sure that you and your family are prepared uh, for a storm. Uh, you can go to getagameplan.org. It will tell you what you need to do to be ready. Um, and uh, being ready in a COVID environment is different than uh, being ready uh, otherwise. Uh, so asking everybody to, to listen to their local officials, pay attention to the weather, uh, and to get a game plan. Today is obviously September the 11th. Uh, so I want to take a remember, I'm sorry, take a, a moment that we can all remember uh, that day 19 years ago. Uh, and I'll ask everyone in Louisiana to lift up in prayer uh, the families who lost loved ones uh, on that day, that horrific day, but also the courage of all of the first responders and other people who, who answered the call uh, of duty. Um, and I would ask people, too, to remember the sense of unity that we had uh, following 9-11 uh, across the country, and, and we should aspire to regain that sense of unity, but without having to have such a traumatic incident uh, to, to cause it. Uh, because I believe we still share more in common as Americans um, than, than that which divides us. Uh, so getting to uh, COVID, I know that uh, since my announcement yesterday that we would be moving to phase three, uh, that you all and, and uh, folks across the state have been very interested in what that uh, is going to look like. The new proclamation, which will go into effect tonight, uh, will outline uh, res the restrictions that will be in place for phase three, and I'll highlight uh, those for you. Uh, restaurants, churches, salons, spas, gyms, uh, other businesses, uh, generally speaking, will be able to open at a maximum of 75% of their occupancy, um, but with social distancing uh, required. Uh, we do know that when it comes to, to bars, they've been closed for on-premises consumption. We've done what we could to, to help them uh, to, to realize some revenue uh, you know, with two of the three video poker machines that they have them remaining open. The ability to do um, uh, drive-through, delivery, curbside pickup. And then the option they have if they have a kitchen uh, to uh, get a license to operate as a restaurant and then follow all the restaurant rules. Uh, but we know that, that there's still a number of them that, that have been closed for uh, on-premises consumption and, and that uh, we wanted to provide a responsible framework uh, for uh, them to open uh, as it is safe to do so. Um, and we've been looking at the guidance coming, for example, from the Coronavirus Task Force and, um, and so forth. Um, so what, what I have decided to do um, is that uh, we're going to have bars remain closed on premises consumptions in parishes with high incidence of COVID-19. Um, and as I mentioned, that's a continued recommendation of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Um, and especially, and you're going to see some slides later that talk about 
uh, the growth in cases as it relates to different age groups. And I think when you look at uh, the 18 to 24 age group um, uh, specifically, uh, you're going you're to see why uh, this is, or at least one of the reasons why this is uh, uh, so important that, that we make sure that we don't open those farm premises consumption where you still have a high incidence of COVID-19. But in those parishes with a positivity rate of 5% or lower for two consecutive weeks, uh, they may opt in. So the parish government will, will have to opt in to on-premises consumption of alcohol at bars. Um, and, and if they do that, the bars will be able to open subject to a number of restrictions. Uh, we'll go through those in just a moment. The two-week po percent positivity is updated every two weeks by the Department of Health. Uh, the next scheduled update is on September the 16th. Uh, if and when reopened uh, pursuant to this um, order, bars will be able uh, to open at 25% capacity up to 50 people total. Indoors, customers will have to be seated for tableside service only. Uh, in addition, they may have no more than 50 customers outdoors. Um, social distancing is, is required uh, indoors and outdoors. Um, and again, if outdoors, they have to be seated for tableside service. Uh, live music will continue to uh, not be allowed. Uh, all drinks will have to be ordered at the table and delivered by bar staff to the table. Again, patrons must be seated. A sale and service of alcohol at bars when they reopen will end at 10 p.m. and patrons will be cleared uh, from the building by 11 p.m. Uh, when uh, this happens, uh, those individuals younger than 21 will not be allowed in a bar. So those 18, 19, and 20 year olds will not be uh, permitted in the bars. For other social gatherings indoors, such as weddings, birthday parties, and the like, uh, they're going to be limited to 50% capacity with a max of 250 people and obviously the social distancing requirements that go along with that. Outdoor uh, crowd sizes are limited to 50% capacity of the outdoor space up to 250 people uh, if folks are going to be in close proximity and social distancing uh, isn't possible. Casinos will stay at 50% capacity and 75% of the gaming position so that will not change uh, under the new order. Alcohol sales for on-premise consumption at all of these venues is going to end at 10 p.m. Uh, when we go to phase three. Uh, it includes bars, as I just mentioned, but it's also going to include restaurants, event centers, reception halls, and casinos. Sporting events like college, high school football, and so forth will operate at a lesser capacity of 25% with social distancing required and without alcohol sales. The statewide mass man mandate remains in place. Uh, the order continues to recommend uh, the most basic of all of the CDC uh, recommendations, uh, and that is those uh, at higher risk of, of severe illness from COVID-19 continue to realize they are safer at home, uh, and they should not go out and, and certainly should avoid large crowds. Um, unless there's some sort of essential activity that they need to engage in, such as getting food or medical care. Um, and this order will be in place for uh, 28 days, uh, expiring on October the 9th. Um, I know that there have been some questions previously about uh, nursing home visitation, what that looks like going forward and potentially uh, in, in phase three. And I wanna address that briefly. Uh, Nothing at the moment is going to change for nursing home visitations. Uh, as you all know, this population continues to be among our most vulnerable and at highest risk uh, for severe outcomes of COVID-19. Uh, and like many, many states, uh, somewhere around 40% of all our fatalities have happened uh, at nursing homes. And this is because there's congregant living uh, where people are in close proximity to one another. So the virus, once it gets in, uh, spreads more easily. And those uh, individuals are much more likely to be vulnerable 
uh, to the disease and have a poor outcome uh, because of age, but also because of the comorbid health conditions. Now that said, um, we know that these past several months have been very tough uh, for the loved ones, uh, but also for the residents. Um, and so LDH, uh, in consultation with CMS, and uh, has been working to, to finalize plans for a pilot program uh, where we're going to try to see uh, if we can uh, allow for some visitation. Uh, it's a be uh, for a 28-day pilot program. It's an outdoor visitation uh, program, um, and similar to the way we're going to do bars, these these. Uh, nursing homes are going to have to be located in parishes with 5% positivity or less and have zero cases in the last 14 days in order to be qualified to participate. Uh, and this is to help minimize the risk for our nursing home uh, residents. LDH will provide uh, additional details in the coming days. And we hope that this pilot is going to be successful uh, and that we can learn. Uh, we also hope that, that there will be more and more areas that get down to 5% or below, uh, and, and certainly that, that more and more nursing homes go 14 days without reporting uh, new cases. Uh, but this is obviously a very delicate uh, situation, and, and I can tell you that the folks at the Department of Health are putting forth great effort to make sure that we can do this in a responsible way. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Bu to come up now and go go through some slides um, that, that talk about uh, the data uh, that we used to inform the decision about moving to phase three. Uh, and then while he's up here, please ask him any questions about uh, the data uh, and or anything else related to uh, to, to health in Louisiana uh, and COVID. Uh, so, for example, any questions about the nursing home policy that I, or pilot, I should say, that I just mentioned or anything else. And then on the back side of that, I'll come back up and wrap up with some updates on Hurricane Laura. So thank you, Governor. Um, so we'll move to the next slide. Um, so as we normally do when we talk about a, a gating decision or update on the, on the data, we want to share um, the data that we're looking at uh, with all of you so you can see um, uh, what, what information we put in front of the governor and, and some of how he, uh, he made his decision. Uh, so this is, uh, again, for, for orientation, uh, when, we took, when we take a look at the upper left-hand corner, you see COVID-like illness. That's a graph showing people who are presenting to an emergency department with symptoms consistent with COVID, and it's the proportion of those individuals over the total number of people who are going to an emergency department. So it gives us a sense of who's showing up with symptoms that are like COVID when they're coming to an emergency room. Um, below that, uh, you have the graph with the purple line showing you the volume of testing that's going on across the state, and the orange bar is showing you uh, the percent positivity. That gray line that you may be able to see there at the bottom of the graph, that's 10%. And again, we want as a state to get below that 10% uh, line. We want as we're seeing the purple line increase or stay stable, uh, we want to see that the orange bars are below uh, that uh, gray line. If we uh, look up at the upper uh, right-hand corner, uh, you see our epi curve, our epidemic curve. These are new cases reported every day. Keep in mind that as we have these backlogs and continue to see backlogs from uh, a variety of different people who are, are, are uh, reporting uh, uh, new cases to us late, we as a state, we in the uh, Department of Health, distribute those backlog cases, not on the day they were reported, but on the day the specimen was collected. So this accurately represents who showed up on what day uh, to, get, to get tested. And what you can see there is um, uh, the line, the black line is with the average uh, of, of those uh, incidences over time. And then finally, in the lower panel, uh, the blue line represents hospitalizations uh, for COVID-19 specifically. Uh, with the orange uh, line and, the, and the, uh, the slope line that follows it showing you the last 14 days. Uh, so we always look at a 14-day period. That's what we've been doing since the beginning of um, uh, the, the gating criteria. That was the recommendation given to us by uh, the federal government and the White House. Um, and what you can see is when you look at the COVID-like illness graph, uh, and, and this is true for every region in the state, COVID-like illness has been on a steady decline, uh, especially since we saw the increase uh, coming out of phase two. 
Um, so since the mask mandate, since the uh, closure of, of bars uh, and the limitation of social gatherings to 50 people or less, COVID-like illness has come down consistently, uh, again, across every region. Uh, when we look at the testing graph, what you see there is a lot of the interruption in our testing that happened as a result of uh, first Tropical Storm Marco and then Hurricane Laura. Um, the state, uh, because we, uh, we needed to, to um, uh, redeploy our resources and especially our partners in the National Guard uh, to where they were needed most to protect uh, um, you know, the public from the imminent uh, threat of a storm, uh, meant that we weren't able to do testing in communities at the level that we might want. And obviously people were thinking about um, uh, they're, they're getting out of the way of, of harm rather than uh, getting tested. So you see this decline there that really represents that week of uh, the storms. Um, uh, but then a, 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 an incline that's coming back. And, and we've been fortunate because our National Guard is, is tremendous uh, that they've redeployed uh, almost immediately and they're, they've got so many fronts that they're working on all at once. One of them is, is partnering again on getting testing into communities across the state. Um, that being said, we're not seeing that line come up uh, uh, very high, as high as I would like it very quickly. Uh, so, uh, you know, one thing that I do want to make sure that the general public hears is that testing is widely available. I do encourage you uh, to go out and get tested if you are uh, certainly having symptoms of COVID, uh, but also if you've been exposed to someone and are a close contact of someone with COVID. And if you've been evacuated or, have, or sheltering because of Hurricane Laura, um, uh, we do recommend as well, because of the transit and the potential exposures you may not be aware of, that you get a test as well to know your status. This would be a good time to, to learn your status. What we see on that graph, though, is uh, uh, percent positivity has been steadily declining. Um, even as tests creep back up, we see that the percent positivity is down. We're at about 6.97% uh, right now, so uh, well below that 10% for the, for the state. When we look at the upper panel, looking at the epi curve, that's new cases, you can see that we've been on a pretty stable decline. Again, that correlates with the mask mandate, the closure of bars, and the restriction of social distancing, or social gatherings rather to 50 people or less. Uh, more recently, there's been a, a bit of an uptick in the state, um, and some of that reflects um, a, a decrease in testing with a new increase in testing. Some of that reflects, frankly, new cases that we know are evolving, especially in settings like universities and schools, um, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but not over a 14-day period. So we haven't met that criteria of a 14-day period. And we look at hospitalizations. Hospitalizations have been on a steady decline, again, since, the, since those new restrictions. Um, and so, you know, strictly speaking, looking at those data, um, you, you've, you've met criteria uh, across those three um, uh, graphs uh, for uh, movement into phase three. I want to look specifically, though, at uh, region one. That's our next graph. This is the greater, oh, sorry, never mind. Let's go back. Uh, I thought we had a region one graph. Um, so so uh, maybe just a point that I'll make then um, in general about the data that we're seeing. Uh, what we uh, communicated to the governor and what the governor talked about yesterday is the data that we don't see up there um, that we all need to be watching out for. Um, and that's that, again, there was a week that we didn't have visibility because of decreased testing. Um, there's frankly uh, not as much testing as we'd like to see amongst shelteries and evacuees right now, so we don't know if there's been transmission that's happened and we just aren't catching it because we're not seeing people take advantage of the testing. So again, I would just emphasize if you're going to a point of distribution, if you're in uh, Region 5 in the Acadiana region, we have testing sites in Lake Charles and in Sulphur. Uh, if you're in New Orleans, if you're in Baton Rouge, we have testing that's available for you in hotels. Want to make sure you take advantage of that to know your status because there's a tremendous amount, uh, or there's a significant amount, I should say, of asymptomatic spread. So you know you need to know how to protect yourself and your family. So certainly would like to see testing come back up. Something else that we haven't quite seen in this data yet, we haven't had enough time to see what the impact of going back to school and universities um, uh, will, will portend. Uh, will show us. And, and part of the reason is because we interrupted schools, right? People went back home and now they've returned to school. So we expect that that's going to be something we're going to watch very carefully in the data, and I'll show you some data around that soon. So we're not quite sure what the impact of return to school was yet, and, and that's going to be probably complicated to un, uh, uh, dis disentangle because we know not everybody went back to full in-person. Uh, most people are, are doing some hybrid of virtual and in-person classes, whether you're in a K-12 through setting or a university setting. Um, and, and then lastly, what we really don't know yet because we don't have enough time is what was the impact of Labor Day? We know that by and large, people did as the governor asked and stayed home, had a staycation, um, and, and celebrated with their immediate household. We unfortunately know that some people didn't. And just like Memorial Day, we won't know the impacts of Labor Day until really we're two weeks out from that. So those are all trends that we're going to be watching this data very closely on 
Um, and, and hopefully what we find is that everybody uh, by and large did what was asked and that we don't see these, these uh, either the cases continue to, to rise or rise more quickly or the hospitalization trend uh, turn around in the wrong direction. Because as you saw, we've got a very active Atlantic season right now, Atlantic hurricane season right now. Uh, and it's not, it's not a good time for us to be um, uh, having multiple fronts in the state uh, facing multiple disasters uh, while we're, we're trying to have, uh, while we're having more COVID uh, increase. So I'll flip to the next slide, uh, just to show you one of the other trends that, that we're particularly uh, focused on and, and concerned about. And we've shown you this before. This is again, that same data, the epidemic curve. So these are new cases, but it's broken down by age group. So you probably can't see out the top, but orange is under 18, gray is 19 to 29 year olds, yellow is 30 to 39 year olds, 40 is 40 to 49 year olds, sorry, blue is 40 to 49 year olds, green is 50 to 59 year olds, purple is 60 to 69 year olds, and then 70 plus is brown. And so what you see is really all of those age groups are tracking together except for the gray, and the gray is the, uh, the 18 to 29 year old group. And if we look at the next slide, We've broken out specifically the under 30s here. I won't go through all of the age groups that are depicted here, but I'll just tell you the green line that is taking a sharp uptick is your 18 to 21 year old age group. So this is an age group that we have a lot of concerns about. This is the group that we know has now gone back to school. Um, and, and despite uh, things like closure of bars, which helped us turn around the rates of, of increase um, uh, case growth that we were seeing during the early phase two. Now, with bars closed, we're still seeing that group come up, um, and that's to be expected. Anytime you bring people together, our best efforts, wearing masks, it's tough uh, when you're bringing large groups together. And, and so we need to watch that very carefully, especially as we talk about activities that people want to take part in, football, gatherings that happen in the fall, all of those kinds of things. This is an age group that could cause uh, or that we, that we could see continue to increase. And it, just as we saw last time where that age group led, the other age groups followed after that, right? Um, you'll see a, a report coming out from the CDC soon. Uh, I think actually uh, it might have already come out today, talking about uh, infections in childcare settings, uh, re re uh, resulting in infections in the households that those children are returning to. So we, we don't take any uh, age groups increase uh, lightly. So that's something we're gonna be watching very closely. And that's part of what shaped the recommendation for the very, uh, uh, one of the restrictions that's placed on bars that are able to reopen in low incidence communities that uh, under age 21, we really just don't want you in that setting because you shouldn't be drinking, you're, you're not of age, and it brings you into a setting that's, that's high risk for transmission. Uh, so I think, next slide. So next slide, this is the summary that we usually show you. This is uh, looking at all of those criteria and looking at all of the regions. Again, as I said, COVID-like illness is decreasing across the state. Um, when we look at cases though, it's a mixed bag. Here, the red asterisks mean that we're seeing a more recent trend of increase, but it's not meeting that 14-day mark. So it's the most recent trend, but it's not meeting a 14-day mark. Despite that, you see we have several regions where we're starting to see an increase again. I will note, um, uh, region five is, is a difficult region. That's the Acadiana, re I'm sorry, that's the Southwest, sorry, the, the Lake Charles and surrounding regions. That's a little bit difficult because all of the numbers in that area plummeted as you'd expect because of evacuation. And now as we see uh, testing surge there and people uh, coming back, we would expect to see some increases in that area. But for the rest of the state, these increases are concerning. And when you look at what's going on in hospitalizations, that's gonna be a trend that really drives a lot of our concerns. As the governor has said uh, from the beginning and certainly from the department standpoint, our biggest concern is being able to have adequate healthcare capacity to meet the needs of Louisiana, not just for COVID, but certainly for COVID and for every other need. So as you start to constrain that capacity through COVID, you have less capacity for heart attacks, strokes, everything else, motor vehicle accidents. Um, so we're watching these trends very carefully. And I think that that's our last uh, slide. So, so maybe in closing before your questions, I would just emphasize as we move into phase three and you now have uh, greater capacity in restaurants, in some bars are gonna be able to, to operate limited, under limited service. You have uh, workplaces that you're gonna be going to that are now able to operate um, with a, a higher capacity limit. It is critical for us to remember that everything that's gotten us to this point still needs to be in place. And by that I mean physical distancing of six feet or more is really important. Um, that, that when we call you and ask if you've been within six feet of somebody um, uh, for greater than 15 minutes, or, or uh, for, yeah, if you've been less than five, six feet from somebody who's, who's a known case for greater than 15 minutes, uh, just because we're in phase three, that doesn't change that requirement. 
you are still going to uh, be a potential contact and have to quarantine if you've been in that context. Less than six feet for greater than 15 minutes. And the most important thing we can do is wear a mask. More and more data shows that wearing a mask, even for people who are shedding the virus, reduces the likelihood that you're spreading that virus to other people. You wear a mask to protect other people. Other people around you are wearing masks to protect you. So let's be a good neighbor uh, and let's continue to wear our masks. So with that, happy to take any, uh, any questions. So I, so I think when we, when we looked at the, the data, and I'd want to confirm this, I think that we're looking at probably right now about five parishes. Five out of 64. Five out of 64. There's still 64. So as the governor noted, we're going to be updating. We, we've already been updating those two-week lookbacks on an ongoing basis. The next update will be on the 16th. Um, I believe it's active from the, the past look back. It's active from a parish opting in. The parish has to be opted right. in. The governing authority has to opt in, and then, it, then it's effective. So for, for those who, who can only hear the mic, what the governor was reemphasizing is that first, first is that, yes, you have to be, uh, the, over the last two checks, the last two two-week checks, so essentially four weeks, have been at 5% positivity or less. And then the parish government has to say this is something we want to opt into because we do understand that this may be a, a, a very important local decision that's being made. And right, now there's only five. right now, I believe that there are five parishes that would meet that criteria. Criterion. What's the nursing home pilot program look like? Is it just family members going to see their loved ones at a outdoor facility and broadly? What does that look like? Yeah, so similarly, and I'll say, Maybe just to give you a longer answer, sorry. Um, you know, what you're going to see us talking about a lot more in the department, now that we have graphs that show us really getting low, is decreasing becomes a little bit less relevant than what's going on in the community. And so percent positivity is really important. What is the level of spread in your community? Um, because you could be at, you know, 1% uh, positivity and you're going to be seeing an increase up to 2%. That's still a very low risk community, right? Whereas, you know, you could be coming down. Um, uh, from a higher percentage, and, and, and we want to continue to see that, that, uh, that improvement. So for nursing home pilot, we're looking at low community spread. So again, we're probably going to be uh, looking at, at something around the 5% level or less. We want to be in areas where we're not seeing a lot of COVID in the community. And then it's going to be about, again, working with uh, the, the nursing homes that are in the pilot, establishing protocols where People are uh, outdoors because that's going to be a safer environment than indoors. We're still going to need to be wearing our personal protective equipment because that's the way to protect your, your loved one. Um, and, and it's going to also have to be a, a pretty you know, nicely managed um, uh, a visitation, meaning uh, you probably want to know who's coming, when they're coming, and clearly symptoms uh, of COVID or recent COVID illness, being quarantined or isolated for COVID during that period are all going to be reasons you can't come to see your loved one to protect your loved one. As the governor noted, out of the 5,000 Louisianans that we've lost so far, over 40% of those were from nursing homes. And so as we look at a way to re-engage with those individuals and re, re -have, you know, have families reunited, we need to do that in a way that doesn't put people in harm's way, and not just your loved one, but the loved ones in the rest of the facility. We'll have more details for you on that uh, soon. OK, thank you. So just, just to make sure we were clear with your question, because I was over there with a the mask on, um, a parish has to be eligible, meaning they have to be at or below the 5% threshold uh, for at least two weeks. Uh, and that's data that's been updated uh, by the uh, Department of Health uh, every two weeks for a while. It's publicly available. And then if that parish is eligible, the governing authority has to opt into uh, allowing this and then if they do then then the system that I described earlier with respect to, to opening those bars in those parishes uh, to on-premises consumption subject to those restrictions uh, will be in place what what my talking points omitted and I need to come back and add to that is uh, if if at some point subsequent to that that parish gets to 10 percent or higher in positivity then those bars will close again. 
uh, and and then and then it starts all over. They're, they're going to have to meet the gating before before those bars could be reopened. The, that gating criteria is going to have to be satisfied again. So. Correct, correct. Because otherwise, you would be opening and closing bars, you know, within a, a day or two of another potentially. Um, and so this this is this is the, the the system we've come up with to try to do this safely uh, and and responsibly with a good uh, measure of local uh, control over that. Do want to go over today's COVID numbers? You may not have have seen them yet. Uh, today uh, we are reporting. 844 new cases, uh, and that is on 27,234 tests. Tragically, we exceeded 5,000 uh, total deaths today, uh, with 41 new deaths being reported, brings us to a total of 5,032. We have 39 fewer people being reported in the hospital. Uh, statewide with COVID-19. That total is down to 723, and we have um, eight fewer people on mechanical ventilators. That number is down to 117. So as I said yesterday, and as Dr. Bu went over with the uh, two weeks of data that we were using, uh, that we were using to inform our decision, uh, we've had some positive trends that have allowed us to make uh, this move. We do have the concerns about what isn't yet reflected uh, in the data, potentially, uh, which, which is what I told you, why I told you yesterday that for me, this was the most difficult decision uh, uh, that I had to make with respect to uh, applying the gating criteria uh, to, to the phasing. Uh, so, so what I want to do is encourage people to really take the mitigation seriously. Because reopening more of the economy, reopening uh, our churches to greater occupancy, uh, lifting some of the restrictions, these things really only work if we continue to do, and quite frankly, we need more people uh, to wear their masks. Critically important. Wash your hands frequently. Stay home when you're sick. Social distance from people not in, in your household. And, and there's a few other rules that, that, that uh, apply. Outdoors, safer than indoors. If you want to support a local restaurant and get a great meal, consider picking it up or having it delivered. Or if there is an option to eat outdoors, eat outdoors. Uh, all of, none of that stuff changes uh, as we move into uh, the next phase. Secondly, I, I want to make sure that people understand um, that there really isn't a lot of room for movement forward beyond phase three until we get past the pandemic, uh, because until such time as social distancing uh, isn't required, then how do you ever go to 100%? Uh, and so I'm not saying that, that there can't be and won't be some uh, adjustments and modifications going forward. Uh, but, but we've gotten into this routine of you, we went from stay at home to 25%, 25% to 50%, 50% to 75%. Um, the, we don't go from 75% to 100% until the pandemic is over. Uh, and so that's, that's what, what I, I need people uh, to, to understand. Uh, with respect to Hurricane Laura, uh, yesterday, I had the opportunity uh, to take some members of our state team, uh, including General Waddell, who's here uh, with us today, uh, to visit with elected officials and uh, the directors of the Offices of Emergency Preparedness uh, in Vernon, Allen, and Cameron Parishes. Uh, those meetings went extremely well. Um, they were clearly very appreciative of the, the tremendous effort made by uh, the state government. Uh, and, and our federal partners, and I want to say how appreciative I am of all of the efforts that they have been making uh, to partner with us and, and the, just the Herculean effort that they are putting uh, forth in order to, to uh, deliver assistance to their people. Uh, we've got tremendous 
damage and devastation across much of Louisiana. We still have a little over 100,000 um, customers without electricity. And this is getting more and more focused in that most southwestern portion of our state, Cameron Parish, Calcasieu Parish, and Beauregard Parish. And as that happens, it, the, the progress is going to get a little slower because the damage to the infrastructure there was just so uh, much greater. Uh, so we need people to continue to be cautious. Uh, heat is, and humidity will remain a problem. People need to pace themselves, drink water, um, and, and uh, be mindful of, of those, those heat-related symptoms. We need people to pay attention uh, when it comes to uh, trauma uh, that, that is induced by cutting trees down or falling off roofs and all of those sorts of things. Uh, running a generator. We still have, like I said, over 100,000 customers without electricity. Generators remain a big part of, um, of what's, what's happening uh, in southwest Louisiana. And that carbon monoxide poisoning is obviously a real threat. Um, so we're asking people to be mindful of that and place their generator at least 20 feet from their home in a well-ventilated area, not under a window or a vent, certainly not in a garage or a crawl space or something like that. I also want, to, want you all to know that there have been nearly 3,000 uh, requests for uh, carbon monoxide monitors. Uh, the fire marshal's office is working with local officials in the various parishes, and they are making thousands of carbon monoxide uh, detectors uh, available. They're, they're combination fire, uh, uh, smoke alarms, I should say, and, and carbon monoxide alarms. Uh, the National Guard has over 4,900 guardsmen uh, activated. Uh, they have distributed almost 6 million liters of water, more than 4.3 million MREs, uh, just shy of a million bags of ice, and getting close to 200,000 tarps. They're also today supporting 25 points of distribution in three hubs. Um, so that's a total of 28 sites uh, throughout seven parishes. Um, and, and I will tell you that we've got tremendous people at the state level doing a lot of work, uh, but everywhere that I have gone, um, the folks on the ground, everybody from the parish president and the leaders at the police jury uh, to, to the individuals that I've seen have been uh, nothing but uh, grateful and, and thankful for the work of our National Guard. Uh, I am not uh, objective about this. I will just simply tell you we have the best National Guard in the United States of America. Uh, they're the best at, at preparing for and responding to a disaster. We know that they've been doing great work with respect to the, to the uh, public health emergency as well. Uh, and then they have a war fighting mission as well. And they are extremely good. Uh, at that. So, General Waddell, I, I just want to tell you on behalf of the state of Louisiana how much we appreciate you and your men and women uh, of the Louisiana National Guard, those soldiers and those airmen. Uh, just tremendous. A couple of other points on Laura. As of this morning, we are just shy of 13,000 individuals in our shelters in Louisiana, almost all of them, just I think maybe 26, uh, were not in um, non congregate sheltering. And that was an awkward way to say it. Almost all 13,000 are in the hotel uh, shelters, uh, non-congregate sheltering. Um, we still have about 4,800 in Texas. And, and what you all need to know is the number of people that we're sheltering is still increasing by smaller numbers, but still increasing thus far every night uh, compared to the night uh, before. More house and union parishes have been added for DSNAP today. So we announced earlier this week they were approved for individual assistance. Uh, they had to request uh, DSNAP. They did so. We then uh, ran that up the flagpole, and they have been approved. Uh, and they will be getting information about when DSNAP will start for them. Um, some uh, tough news for some. Uh, FEMA has notified the Louisiana Workforce Commission uh, that the Lost Wages Assistance Program, uh, which is the 300 dollar per week enhanced federal benefit uh, that a number of our citizens have been receiving is going to end uh, with the week ending September the 5th. And I know that that week has already come and gone, 
uh, but we're paying uh, benefits one week at a time. Uh, L LWC have, has received funding, and remember, we're dealing with FEMA on this because unlike traditional unemployment assistance benefits, it's not the U.S. Department of Labor that we're working with. Uh, it's actually FEMA. The money is coming out of the disaster relief fund. Uh, but the Workforce Commission received funding for the week ending August the 29th uh, today, and they'll be processing uh, those payments immediately. Um, you know that funds don't appear until the next business day, and so those funds should start showing up in people's accounts on Monday. Uh, we have requested uh, funding from FEMA for the week that ends September the 5th. We don't yet have it. Uh, we, we will be getting uh, that funding, we've been assured. Uh, and as soon as that happens, we will get those payments out as well. Uh, and so with that, uh, I'm going to take a little water, and then I'll take your questions. Yes, sir. With all of these moving parts, is there one area that most concerns you as far as concerns about going backwards? It sort of looks like yeah. 18 to 29 year olds slash bars seem to be pretty high up. I'm not sure what you're talking about, but just what of all of these components? Yeah. Um, well, I guess um, that's just really kind of hard um, because uh, I'm, since the very beginning of this public health emergency, I've been I've been concerned about just about every aspect of it. Um, what I'm concerned most about uh, today on September the 11th is the impact that Labor Day may have. And the reason I say that is we have experienced at the beginning of the summer with Memorial Day. Uh, and we know that that's, that's when we had a surge in cases driven by the younger population, particularly those in that 18 to 24, 18 to 29 year old group. Um, it is my hope that behavior was different because everybody went through that process. They saw what it did to our state, and we had all summer to talk about it. The White House was talking about it. Dr. Burks was talking about it. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that that doesn't happen to us again. Um, I am relieved that we are getting our testing numbers back up. Uh, we're back out with statewide testing, a lot of it done by the National Guard, but, but we have health clinics and, and uh, hospitals and other entities that are, that are uh, urgent care clinics and so forth that are doing a lot of testing. And so we're going to be watching uh, very, very closely. But if you just ask me today to pinpoint one thing, uh, it, it would be the, the potential for Labor Day to really disrupt uh, the progress that we have been seeing and the progress that, quite frankly, was, was shown to you a while ago. Um, uh, on those slides that allowed us to go to, to phase three. Uh, and, and, of course, I'm mindful that, that yeah, we're, we've started um, a school uh, and our college campuses have, have opened uh, to students. Uh, the, the thing there that I take some comfort in is that uh, there's still an awful lot of virtual learning and hybrid learning, uh, and so we don't have many uh, school settings where all the students are present uh, for, for, for their instruction. So th those are the things that, that really concern me. Um, I remain optimistic that the, the people of Louisiana is going to do what's required uh, to protect one another um, and, and make sure that we don't have that, that big spike. And we, we will be watching very, very carefully. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, there's always, there's always, uh, whether it's because of Labor Day or anything else, you, you watch the numbers. Uh, and, and what we are not going to do is put ourselves on a course where we lose the ability to deliver life-saving care in our hospitals. Uh, that hasn't happened. It didn't happen. And, and if you remember back, we, you had that, that uh, that graph that showed the cases over time and so forth. It didn't happen in the first surge, it didn't happen in the second surge, and I'm not gonna let it happen going forward. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that certainly remains possible. Uh, again, I'm hopeful that we're not going to get anywhere close to that, um, uh, but, but if we have to, we will. Um, that's what I have said all along. And, and really, that's why we keep making the point, and, and we know this, it's not theory anymore. 
we had that huge surge in March and, and April, and we were able to flatten the curve through a stay home order. And so there was this concern that the only way you would be able to reduce your case growth, flatten the curve and so forth is a stay home order. But, but we have shown here in Louisiana and elsewhere, you don't have to do that if people will in fact wear their masks uh, and social distance and wash their hands and you take other uh, strategic actions, you can still leave open a very large part of your economy. You can have your houses of worship open. You can do some of the things, especially outdoors, uh, that, that, that you want to do um, and have as much normalcy as possible without those cases skyrocketing. Uh, but it really is, to a very large extent, up to the people of Louisiana as to whether collectively enough of, of, of us will uh, adhere to these mitigation measures that we can be successful. And that's why we keep saying the same thing over and over. And, and, you know, I've said a while ago that I have a lot of concerns. Quite frankly, uh, one of the concerns that I have is any time you announce that you're, you're going to go to the next phase, that, that people tune out all the talk that Dr. B uh, gave you and that I've given you, that Dr. Burks has given people and everybody else about how COVID is still here and the essentials remain essential around wearing masks and keeping distance and washing hands and staying home when you're sick and decreasing your activity and protecting the vulnerable. You say all of that stuff and some people are gonna say, well, uh, we're, we're, we're going forward. Um, and, and that's all that they think about. Uh, and that, that, uh, that mindset is what can cause us to have real issues too. So we, we really need people uh, to be mindful and we're asking local elected officials, business leaders, nonprofit leaders, faith leaders to all set good examples uh, so, so that we can stay on top of this virus and keep those trends going in the right direction. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I'm sorry, say that again. Yeah, well, well, first of all, uh, with respect to the public sector or the private sector? The I'm sorry. All right, I, I get the question now. Uh, yeah, so, so Commissioner Darden uh, works with all the agency heads um, in order to, to make sure that, that uh, state employees are working where they can be uh, uh, most efficient and productive, but also in, in the safest uh, possible way. Uh, and so where you have offices, uh, for example, where uh, y if you wanted to get to 75 percent, you can't be at 100 percent. And so some of those people will probably continue to work at home and they're, they're going to he works with agency by agency because not every situation uh, is the same. Some agencies work in office buildings that are more or less traditional and, and with cubicles and, and, and so forth. Um, and it's it is harder to safely work in, in that environment. Uh, than it is elsewhere, you know, for example, uh, people that might work with wildlife and fisheries, they're out in a boat um, checking on people who are teal hunting this weekend. Uh, so, so that's one of the safest things uh, that you can be doing. So those individuals obviously can't do that and work from home, but they also don't need to work from home, uh, but they do need to have their mask on uh, when, when they go and, and ask for that hunter for a license. Any other, any other questions? Well, look, thank, thank you all for continuing to, to cover this. Um, I do kind of want to finish where I started. Uh, if you look from the Gulf of Mexico to the west coast of Africa, you're going to see a number of storm systems, most of which pose no threat to Louisiana. Uh, but the one just off of Florida does, and it's too soon to know what the ones just off the coast of Africa will do but we do know we have to be prepared. Uh, it will be very, very difficult for our state if we uh, have to go through another hurricane or significant storm in our present posture uh, where we have people who are already sheltered uh, from the last storm and, and, and we're still trying to recover from the power outages and everything else. So let's all lift one another up in prayer um, let's, let's be good neighbors. Let's do what's required of us, uh, both as it relates to the weather uh, and to COVID-19. 
in order to, to take care of ourselves and our families and, and one another. Uh, with that, I think we will have our next appearance with you all on Monday, and we'll certainly let you know what time that's going to be, unless, Shauna, we want to do that now? Yeah, in the afternoon. Okay, so it'll be, it'll be Monday afternoon.